I get an email from my boss with a drawing attached and he says, I need you to hurry up and start programming this part because we're running out of time on it and we need to get it going right now. I open it up and immediately see that it's this super complex part. It was one of those type of parts that the more you stare at it, the worse it gets. Number one, it's like 17 inch diameter and over 90% of the material is getting removed. It hardly had any flat faces on it. It had thin walls with all these different tapers and bosses coming off of it that all had to be blended together. Super tight tolerances. It even had these blind threaded holes on the inside diameter that the only way to reach them was with a special made right angle head. And just the shape of the part itself was going to make it extremely difficult to hold after you rough it out. So naturally fixtures were going to have to be built for every operation after the first one. But that wasn't even the worst part. I knew all that stuff could be easily worked through, especially if it was made out of a good stable material. And that's when I learned that sometimes nightmares really do come true because this part was being made out of Teflon. And it wasn't just regular virgin Teflon either. Now up until this point, the only parts that I'd ever made out of Teflon were simple parts like bushings and plugs. But still, I remembered how frustrating it was to hit tight tolerances in that material because at the time I'd never heard of thermal expansion and I didn't realize how much it could grow and shrink. What we would do back then was we would run one piece, measure it, and then let it sit overnight. We'd come in the next day and remeasure it to see what the difference was, then make adjustments, and then run the rest of the order. So I knew since this part was so complex, I needed to do some heavy research. Luckily, whoever made the drawing listed their preferred supplier in the notes of the drawing, and when I looked them up, not only were they a manufacturer of various types of Teflon, they have also machined it in-house for the past 50 years. So I call them up and I kind of describe what I'm making and they were super helpful and they actually sent me some research papers on Teflon. So I started reading and I find that the thermal expansion rate for this material is astronomical. So even a small temperature change can make the material grow and shrink by a considerable amount. And the bigger the part you make, the more it's gonna move. So with my part being 17 inch diameter, it was gonna be extremely difficult to hit a lot of these tolerances that were on the drawing. And then to make things even worse, I find out that the manufacturing process they use to make the material is actually determined by the tolerances you need to hold on the part when it's finished. So for example, this material is not cast, it's actually pressed. And if you only have to hit, say, a plus or minus five thousandths tolerance, then they may simply press the material with a low tonnage at room temperature for X amount of time. Whereas if you have to hit a plus or minus one thou tolerance, they may heat the press up to a certain temperature, put more pressure on it, and also increase the time that they leave it under pressure. Then after it's finished, they may even go ahead and stress relieve the raw stock. So I called the material supplier back and I started asking about all this stuff that I just read and if it was really going to make that much of a difference. And they was like, oh yeah, with the tolerances your part has, we definitely need to take these steps when we make the material. In fact, they actually suggested that they needed to go ahead and stress relieve the raw stock, and then after we rough it all out, send it back to them and have it stress relieved again. After hearing all this, I started panicking because I knew whoever is in charge of ordering the material hasn't done any of this research, so I guarantee none of this is specified to the material supplier. So before I ended the call, I asked if they had seen the order come through yet, and they said no, that I was the only person they had talked to from my company. And I thought that was kind of odd since my boss said that we needed to hurry up and get it done, but it looks to me like they haven't even ordered the material yet. So I started calling everyone I could think of to find out if we've already ordered the material and try to put it on hold if we have before we spend a lot of money on something that isn't going to work. And come to find out, the engineer that was over procuring the material ordered it from a different supplier and he never even called the preferred supplier that was listed on the drawing. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I imagine there's a pretty good reason they went through the trouble of listing the company on the drawing. And the least I would do is try to find out why. So we called the engineer and asked him if he knew about the different manufacturing processes depending on the tolerances of the part and the stress relief and the thermal expansion. And of course, he didn't know any of it. So nothing was specified to whoever he ordered the material from. And even after we explained it all to him and tried to get him to understand how big of a problem this is and that we need to give ourselves the best chance for success by getting the material made correctly. But instead of listening to us, he thought he would, as he put it, calm any concerns that we may have by setting up a meeting with us and the people he ordered it from. So we're in this conference call with his suppliers 
And I start asking them all these technical questions. And within minutes, it becomes pretty clear that these guys didn't know anything about the material we were ordering from them, which I was confused by considering how knowledgeable the other company was until they said they were actually not a manufacturer of the material. And they were just a third party that was going to order it from somewhere else, mark it up, and then sell it to us. But they did finally admit that even though it would mean losing a substantial order, we probably needed to go ahead and order the material from the original preferred supplier. After the call was over, you could tell that the engineer knew he messed up by the sound of his voice when he said, yeah, I believe now more than ever we should use the preferred supplier from the drawing. Well, it's a good thing because you wouldn't listen to us before. And yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good call. We almost made a very expensive mistake. The material alone was over $70,000 and we most certainly would have scrapped every piece of it. Not to mention the hundreds of labor hours we would have wasted in the process. You know, I could have been stubborn just like that engineer. And when he argued about switching suppliers, I could have just accepted it and stood by and watched as our shop failed and lost a ton of money just to say I told you so. Or I could have sat back from the very beginning and said, you know what, that's not my job. Which seems to be a pretty fashionable statement in today's society. But what a lot of people don't see is that everyone in your company is riding in the same boat. And letting your company fail just to see this other person go down is actually causing you and everyone else in your company to go down with them. Whether you like it or not, you have to learn to swallow your pride and do the right thing. Thank y'all for watching. If you want to support free education, give us a like and subscribe, and we'll see y'all next time.